Thanks, I wasn't sure what note I was going to start on. <laughs> you know, something, uh, something's been happening in Iran over the last 20 years. You probably haven't heard about it on the national news, not on ours, certainly not on Iran's national news. Um, they really don't want people knowing about it. But, um, but it's well on the radar of the Iranian government. Um, over the last 20 years, it's been estimated that millions of Iranian people have come to faith in Christ. Um, far more than would be possible by person to person sharing of the gospel because you're not allowed to do that in Iran. And conversion to Christianity is illegal. Evangelism is illegal. And yet these converts to Christianity have been so resolute in their faith, they're willing to put up with the loss of their jobs, they're willing to put up with fines, they're willing to put up with imprisonment and beatings, and in the most extreme case, it's actually the death penalty is prescribed for conversions to Christianity, and they're standing up to all of those things rather than to announce, renounce their faith in Jesus. You look at that and you say, how in the world did that come about? Well, you know, their own testimony, what the people there are saying, is that they came to understand the gospel and the Christian faith through dreams that they had. A couple of years ago, I had one of our deacons ask me about that. He, he said, have you heard what's going on in Iran? And I said, I have heard what's going on in Iran. We talked about it, and, you know, it's been investigated, and the conversions are real, and the willingness to endure persecution for the faith is real, and that there's no legal gospel witness there is true and real. And so he asked me, he said, what do you make of that? Do you think that God is speaking to people in dreams today? And I told him I didn't think so, that I thought that the canon of Scripture was closed, that, that God doesn't give private revelations to individuals, that, in fact, oftentimes I've seen people who claim to have private revelations from God, well, it's, it's just a vector for egregious abuse or sin. And he asked me, so what do we do with that? What indeed do we do with it? I want to read to you today from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 19 through 34. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confess freely, I am not the Christ. And they asked him then, who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. And finally they said, well, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. Now, some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. 
I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him, except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. And, Father, may we receive that testimony today. Fill us by your Spirit. And, and, Father, grant to us that we would not merely know about you, but that we would really know you, that we would encounter you. For James has told us that if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. And so by your Holy Spirit today, we do so through Christ our Lord. Amen. If we will only accept God on our terms, we will miss encountering him if he comes to us on his. There's two ways that we may look for the Lord, but there's only one way to see him. You know, it's interesting as we look at the start of the Gospel of John, we see this fellow, John the Baptist. He's a bit of a strange individual, lives out in the wilderness, wears odd clothing, has an odd diet. And then we have the Pharisees. They're part of the establishment. And both John the Baptist and the Pharisees were looking for the Messiah but they were looking for him in different ways. But both John and the Pharisees were expecting the coming of the Messiah. You know, historians like the Roman Tacitus or uh, the, the Jewish historian Josephus tell us of the expectation of the coming of the Messiah at this period of time. And the Pharisees were waiting expectantly for the coming of the Messiah. And John expected him too, which is what prompted his preaching. We're told in verse 23 that John said to them, I'm the voice of the one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Prepare the way for the Lord. Both John and the Pharisees had reason to be skeptical of people making messianic claims. In Acts chapter 5, we're told of uh, Rabbi Gamaliel, who speaks of two people who claimed to be the Messiah, whose claims came to nothing. Uh, one fellow is a man by the name of Thutis. We know nothing of him outside the New Testament. The only mention that we have of him is in Acts chapter 5. But the other man mentioned, Judas of Galilee, is better known to history. He led a revolt against the Romans in AD 6 because he said it was unlawful to pay taxes to Caesar. And he rose up claiming to be the Messiah, and that revolt was crushed. Judas was killed. But his movement started the party of the zealots who we encounter in the New Testament. And though both John and the Pharisees were expecting the Messiah, neither knew who he was. The Pharisees didn't know. John says to them, I'm baptizing with water, but among you stands one you do not know. He's the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. If, if they had known who the Messiah was, they wouldn't have asked John, are you the Messiah? But we see that John himself didn't know who the Messiah was. In verse 33, he says, I myself did not know him. The reason I came baptizing with water was so that he might be revealed to Israel. He says in verse 33, I would not have known him, except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize 
with the Holy Spirit. And so there's similarities between John and the Pharisees, but John recognizes the Lord. The Pharisees did not, and most of them never would. If we will only accept God on our terms, we will miss encountering him if he comes to us on his. Now, let me tell you that God never works contrary to his word. But he may act in ways that we don't understand very well. The Pharisees didn't recognize God when they encountered him because they thought that God was confined within the bounds of their understanding of God's word and God's world. But, you know, the problem is that our knowledge of the facts is often incomplete. A lot of times people will act on the information that they have. They just don't have complete information. Let me give you an example of that. In John chapter 7, we're told that there were people arguing over who Jesus is. And we read, some said, this is the Christ, but others said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem? See, we know that this can't be the Christ because the word of God tells us it can't be the Christ. Because the Christ doesn't come out of Galilee. The Christ comes from Bethlehem, and this man comes from Galilee. Of course, what they did not know was that he, in fact, was born in Bethlehem, was there for only a short time before his family fled to Egypt and then came back and settled in Galilee. But, but our knowledge of the fact are often incomplete. And our knowledge of what the Scripture means often is incomplete. In Matthew chapter 2, when we read of Jesus' family coming back from Egypt to go live in Galilee, we read that his family went and lived in a town called Nazareth so that what was spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. Have any of you gotten out of concordance and gone back and looked at what Old Testament passage says he will be called a Nazarene? Because I'll save you the trouble. There's no passage that says that. There's no passage that says he shall be called a Nazarene. And yet it's interesting that Matthew doesn't say, as he so often does, he doesn't say as spoken through the prophet Isaiah or as spoken uh, through Jeremiah. But he says that what was spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. And Matthew is telling us what God means through the prophets. We could look at various passages of Scripture. For example, Isaiah 53, that tells us that he would not be of any kind of comeliness or attractiveness, that we should be attracted to him. You remember the question of one of the disciples will meet him a bit later in John's Gospel when his brother comes and says, we found the Messiah, it's Jesus of Nazareth. He says, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? And so Matthew is not quoting this particular prophet or that particular prophet, but he's telling us what the scriptures mean. And our knowledge of what the scriptures mean is often incomplete. It's important for us to understand because some people seem to believe, the Pharisees certainly seem to believe, that the Bible holds and contains God like a bottle holds a genie in the old Persian mythology. And that certainly makes for a safe God. 
He comes out when we open the book, goes back into it when we close it. But lest I be too hard on the Pharisees, put yourself in their position. Um, picture John the Baptist. Here's a guy who's out in the wilderness wearing, who, or living who knows where, dressed like Elijah. That's what he's dressed like. He eats bugs. It's always funny to me, you know, in a lot of the movies you see John the Baptist portrayed, it's kind of like Friar Tuck. He's this like, kind of like rotund guy. Pretty sure that a guy who eats bugs is not a rotund guy. He's probably this, you know, scrawny kind of fellow. And, and John himself is not sure who the Messiah is, but then he finds out. How does he find out? Listen to what he tells us. He gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. Let me ask you a question. Is that something that you would be inclined to believe? You know, I was driving back from uh, Winchester the other day and on uh, Route 7, and there, was a, and there was a Jeep up ahead of me, and, the, and, and, and the, the Jeep had a spare tire, and it had a tire cover on it. This fellow, you know, apparently had somebody do this for him. And as I come to the stoplight, there's this tire cover, and it says, Bible prophecy is true. And I thought, oh boy, here we go. There's going to be all kind of nutty stuff. But, but what it was was a call to repent of sins and believe in the gospel. And it was not a bad gospel presentation, but I thought to myself, what a nut, right? Why, why did I think that? Well, it's because when I came to faith in Christ, things like that did not impress me. A, a, a reasoned presentation reasonable thinking. That, that impressed me. But, uh, but stuff like that, that seemed kind of on the edge. You know, I drove by and the guys are with wild hair and a big beard and stuff like that. And, and, the, and the Pharisees were not impressed by John. Some people were. Two of Jesus' early disciples followed Jesus because John said, that's the one, there he is. But I wonder, you know, when I look at this, I wonder, what, would you have believed John's testimony? Would I? I hope that if I had seen Jesus himself, I would have believed. I don't know what I would have made of John. There were some who did, some who followed because of him. But the Pharisees didn't because they were sure that God couldn't work that way. If we only accept God on our terms, we'll miss encountering him when he comes to us on his. And so I want to go back to what's happening in Iran. Do, 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 we, do we need to change our theology so that we can open our eyes to encountering God? Maybe. Not necessarily. Uh, I think that bringing the gospel message to people is essential. I think it would be a very bad idea to rely on the gospel coming to people through dreams. And I'll tell you why. I can tell you from the scriptures why that is. It's what I told our deacon when I talked to him. In Acts 10, there was a Gentile fellow by the name of Cornelius. Maybe you can read about this this afternoon. His name is Cornelius. He's a Gentile guy. He's praying. He's a, he's a, a God-fearing man. He's a devout man. He has a vision of an angel. You know what the angel tells him? He doesn't tell him the gospel. 
He says, there's a guy down in Joppa. His name is Peter. He's got a message for you. Send to him. He's going to come and tell you the message. Right? It just seems that that's the way that God usually works. In Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 15, the Apostle Paul says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach to them unless they are sent? And, and so my deacon friend asked me, he said, does, does what's happening in Iran change your theology? And I said to him, it doesn't. And he said, so what do we do with the conversions in Iran then? John chapter 9, we're going to meet a man um, who was born blind, and Jesus healed him. And because it was the Sabbath, and because the Pharisees were sure that God could not do that, he wouldn't heal on the Sabbath, they summoned him to question him. And, and they said to him, I'm quoting them here, give glory to God, we know this man is a sinner. I love the man's answer. He said, whether he's a sinner, I don't know. What I know is that I was blind, and now I see. And you know, they are not happy with his answers. Or you, can, you can see it through the text. They're becoming increasingly agitated and angry. And they finally say, look, we're disciples of Moses. We know the book. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. And the man answered, remember the answer? He said, well, that's an amazing thing. He opened my eyes, but you don't know where he came from. If we only accept God on our terms, we'll miss him when we encounter him on his. So let me go back to my friend's question. If you're not going to change your theology, what do you do with the conversions in Iran? How would you answer that? What do you do with the conversions in Iran? You know what I said to him? I said, what do I do with them? I praise God for them. I praise God for them. I don't need to understand how God works in order for him to work. You know, God has never said to me, hey, I'm planning to do something. Let me just check with you first and see if you understand it. That has never happened. If we only accept God on our terms, we'll miss him when we encounter him on his. Um, you, you like biographies? I like to read biographies. I've been reading a biography by Walter Isaacson on Albert Einstein. Do you know that, uh, by the way, that Einstein didn't like math, didn't do math for you? He had to get help with his math. Um, but, but particularly interesting was his argument with a, a colleague, a fellow by the name of Werner Heisenberg, um, who is the theoretical physicist who is credited with establishing quantum mechanics. And uh, Einstein didn't like quantum mechanics. Part of Heisenberg's observation was that the momentum and position of subatomic particles could not be simultaneously known. And it wasn't merely that we didn't know them, they, they couldn't be known. So you could only know them statistically. Einstein did not like that. He, he wanted the kind of precision that you'd have for the planets going around the sun for subatomic particles. And he said repeatedly in protest to Heisenberg and to anyone who would listen, it cannot be so, God does not throw dice. That's his famous saying, God does not throw dice. Well, Heisenberg is pretty well accepted as proven today. 
But you know, Einstein was correct. God does not throw dice. Einstein's mistake was in thinking that whatever was known to God was knowable and understandable to him. God, I'm convinced of it, God never acts contrary to his word. But he may act in unexpected ways, in ways contrary to our limited understanding of both his word and his world. Christ is now risen and ascended into heaven. And he has sent his Holy Spirit to the church with the purpose that we would encounter him. I fear that sometimes people miss encountering God because they're too busy determining what God can and cannot do. And if we only accept God on our terms, we will miss him when we encounter him on his. Father, fill us, we pray, with that spirit that Jesus sent to us. And, and Lord, give us uh, grace to marvel at the things you do, to know your word, to believe your word. And Father, I, I, I want to affirm that to know that you never act contrary to your word. But to know as well, Lord, that our understanding of both your word and the world that you've made is limited. And there are things that just don't make sense to us, that don't add up, that don't check our boxes for us. And Father, when we encounter those things, help us to rejoice at the things you do. Help us to rejoice that there are so many people coming to Christ uh, in Iran. Uh, however that works, if I can ever understand it or never understand it, may I always praise you for that. That everybody who comes to faith in you, it's a miracle of your grace. Lord, let us behold you, let us encounter you in those ways that you come to us and accept you on your terms rather than demanding ours. We'll give you the praise for it. Amen.